less salty, uh, and stuff like that. Uh, I'm going to talk like this, and if you can't hear me, kind of make some gestures in the back to let me know that I should speak a little bit louder, and I'm happy to do that. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about meta community ecology, and I have not exact. I don't have a good beat on who you all are, so I'm going to kind of start from uh, early, kind of start from basics, and uh, give you my sense of what ecology is and why meta community ecology, how it ties in and how it came to be it important, at least my thinking. So ecology, broadly speaking, can be divided into two types of approaches, a large-scale pattern approach. And here, for example, I recently read uh, Alexander von Humboldt's uh, biography, which how many of you have read that? Isn't it awesome? I mean, the guy is just like, you, everyone should read it. It's like really inspiring. Uh, so he was one of the, you know, I'm tempted to call him the grandfather of ecology because the father of ecology to me is uh, Charles Elton, and that's that. Uh, but he's uh, uh, earlier, and he was important because he was the, one of the first people to notice that vegetation patterns, plant distributions, uh, kind of had a repeated pattern uh, with altitudinal gradients, and that these patterns associated with altitude repeated themselves with latitude, um, so that tundras were at lower elevation and high latitudes than in the tropics. So kind of a macro scale pattern, and he interpreted this in terms of ecological processes. And so in that sense, he was an early ecologist. The other thing he's really awesome about, he's probably the first scientist to explicitly try for synthesis. Uh, so he wrote, a, he wrote a book called Cosmos, which was the first attempt to synthesize science as it was uh, known at, uh, during the latter part of his life. Uh, I really encourage you to read his biography. Okay, I've wasted how many minutes? Who knows? Uh, okay, so this is kind of the large-scale approach. You go and you look at patterns mostly, and you try to understand the distribution of species or the distribution of processes uh, across uh, large-scale uh, variation. The alternative is uh, the focus on local-scale interaction. So here, I'm going to evoke Charles Elton because he was really the first person to propose some of the main ways that we could think about the way species interact in their day-to-day -day life to produce ecological uh, interactions and, and patterns. Um, so uh, there's a local scale interaction. Here's this painting of a pond, which is what I usually study, going from bacteria to uh, fish, et cetera. And you know, you can kind of narrow in and imagine all the little interactions that are going on among these organisms to affect how they interact with each other and how they affect each other's abundances. At the large scale pattern, uh, you have this uh, broader perspective comparing across landscapes. Sure, I'll show it again, I think, hopefully, if my brain is still okay uh, later, but it's an aerial photograph of uh, ponds in, um, prairie pothole ponds in Siberia. <clears throat> so the big challenge for ecologists, uh, especially community ecologists, is the problem that Darwin posed in his entangled bank problem. And this problem is that if species are interacting with each other across a network, be it at a local scale or at a spatial scale, uh, or at a larger spatial scale, um, <clears throat> there is this problem of trying to understand how these interactions alter the dynamics that you see. So <clears throat> uh, we're, we can imagine, you know, it's easy to look at interactions in ecology and see many of the direct interactions. So for example, in this little food web, uh, introduced rats, uh, kill some of the uh, shorebirds, and, alt and indirectly alter the distribution of the shorebirds prey, which affects the bottommost trophic level, and sometimes cascades it back up to affect um, <coughs> other interactions. So we have direct interactions. Those are often you know, not too hard to imagine studying. Uh, and then we have these indirect chains, which can go crazy. <clears throat> so I'd like to show this picture. Uh, this is a marine food web. 
And uh, the reason I like it is that it has this legend over here that says, a simplified food web. So, uh, you know, you, like if you're uh, one of those people who wants to dot every I and cross every T and identify every causal relationship, uh, you might as well abandon hope at this point because you're just not cut out to be a community ecologist. Uh, and it's just not going to happen for you. <clears throat> so uh, this network of interactions is the challenge that uh, community ecologists have. Maybe other ecologists, like if you're an ecosystems ecologist, you might also have this problem. And if you're a population biologist, you probably have this problem and you just don't realize it. Uh, so, uh, so it's really at the core of the problem of being an ecologist is the way that these interactions, causal interactions, complex and indirect, affect each other. And uh, at the local scale, um, ecologists have historically developed some important tools to try to help them understand these um, phenomena. And I'm thinking here of it's a picture of him when he was 27 and he wrote his book Animal Ecology in which he introduced four important uh, basic concepts to ecology including the niche concept, the food web concept, the energy pyramid, and uh, the other one was uh, body size relations which you know I didn't include here. Um, in addition, uh, the other important concept that's uh, involved is the recycling of nutrients and materials. And I put um, Ray Lindemann's photo up here uh, as one of the people that was really important in helping us think about that. So this is kind of the historical um, perspective. And being an ecologist, uh, wait, I think I lost something. Oh, I deleted that slide, okay. Uh, so, What's really cool in being an ecologist is to realize that these fundamental concepts have themselves evolved a lot. So now, for example, we can study complex food webs like the North Baltic Sea using network theory, the same kind of theory that drives the way Google searches go, for example, et cetera. And we can study the movement of nutrients and materials using stoichiometric ecology, for example, et cetera. <coughs> However, there's still some really big challenges in uh, modern ecology, including explaining patterns of biodiversity. Um, so despite the successes that we've had, there's still, uh, you know, we still struggle to understand why there are X number of species in particular communities or ecosystems. Uh, we struggle also to understand why there's predictable patterns in uh, community variation. So, uh, Humboldt pointed out that we have these repeatable patterns in vegetation with elevation and latitude and despite you know finding that there's repeatable patterns uh, trying to explain their nature uh, and their predictability is still something that we struggle with and part of that is because we don't really know as much as we would like about the stability and whether they're tipping points etc and so uh, you know, these are kind of the challenging questions that would be really nice to address, not just because they're interesting, although for me that's the most important part, but also because they will help us understand uh, how to cope with environmental issues that are important. Uh, so the proposition of meta-community ecology is that if we only apply these tools that we've learned, these basic concepts from Elton and Lindemann, et cetera, to the local scale, uh, they, they may have limited application because communities are interconnected to each other by the dispersal of organisms and the movement of materials. So for example, uh, we can ask a question like, imagine that you have a local community. I think of a pond or a lake. Uh, the, o open is, the ocean is much more open, but let's imagine like an estuary or something like that that has kind of a certain degree of distinctiveness from other such communities. And let's imagine that there's a change. So it could be an anthropogenic change, you know, due to pollution or something like that, or some sort of disaster, uh, you know, cataclysmic thing. 
and uh, there's a perturbation and some species go extinct. That uh, extinction uh, will change the uh, community and will, you know, uh, be forever unless new species can colonize and reestablish either the original species that went extinct and allow it to play the role that it previously played or allow a new species to replace it in some way that would uh, change the response of the ecosystem to this disturbance or to this environmental change. So, uh, so it could involve also extinction, so like rescue effects uh, that could be important. And uh, so these would be cases where limited dispersal would have consequences to, the ecolo to multiple ecological phenomena. There's also another way in which uh, dispersal can be important, and that's through source sink effects. So um, this is the case where dynamics at one place depend on the immigration or the movement of materials from another place. So like one example that I like to cite, which is marine, and so I'm going to use it over here, is um, Calinus finmarchicus, and I may be completely misrepresenting this story because I read it in a paper uh, that I trust is okay, but if you guys <laughs> have a different opinion about this conclusion, let me know. So apparently, Calinus finmarchicus in the North Atlantic only has one or two hotspots where its birth rate exceeds its death rate. And yet, it's the most widely dispersed calanoid copepod in the North Atlantic, and it's critical to the food web, especially around uh, some of the Chesapeake Bay and et cetera. And so the reason it can play this role is that these hot spots are extremely hot, and then the movement of currents moves these organisms elsewhere where they are dying. Their birth rate is lower than their death rate. And so if you were to cut off, so if you were to cut off their immigration, they would go extinct. At least that's the story. Um, so uh, another way in which the movement of organisms and materials between sites can be important. So to, uh, so the idea behind meta-community ecology to combine, to look at how interactions at a local scale play out when they're also considered uh, to interact with dispersal. So I was extremely fortunate in my career to use the word meta-community without really knowing what I meant when I used it and having a bunch of people going, what do you mean and why is your idea so different from mine? Okay. I'm, I'm glad to be protected. Let me uh, double check on something here. Okay, hmm. it's uh, never done that before to me. Uh, and uh, so this was when I was an assistant prof and I was discussing this with one of my older colleagues, Bob Holt, who's now my colleague at Florida. And he said, you know, this seems like the perfect thing to try to organize a working group at NCS, the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. How many of you don't know what that is? All right, anyway, it was cool. It's kind of gone away, unfortunately, but uh, it was a center that first uh, allowed ecologists to focus on synthesis. And in that way, it was really cool. So I put in a proposal, and we started a working group. Here's about half of the people. These are the ones that went to the first meeting. And uh, this is me over here. I was younger, fitter, hairier, uh, et cetera. But, um, it was a really, really outstanding working group and really thrilling to be a part of. And we wrote a paper uh, in 2004 that tried to organize a thinking about meta communities at the time. And uh, that's been my most successful paper. So, you know, <laughs> if I'm here, it's largely because of that, right? That's the first one we read. <laughs> uh, so, um, and uh, so the use of the word meta-community uh, has increased exponentially, and it's uh, currently, you know, like I'm keeping tabs on who's in first place. Um, uh, metabolic, metabolic scaling is 
we've passed metabolic scaling, and so I'm quite proud of that. <laughs> anyway, uh, I didn't have, you know, like whatever contribution I did to this should be divided by 12, because there were 12 authors on this paper. Uh, so to try to give you a feeling for what meta-community ecology is, I like to look at this photo of these ponds in Siberia. And they show patterns that are really interesting. So, um, you know, these ponds differ from each other. Some of you, you can see in this uh, satellite image, or it's, uh, uh, I think it's an airplane. But uh, some of them are clear, some of them are blue, some of them are green, uh, and they show spatial patterns that vary quite a bit. And so you can look at this and ask yourself, geez, uh, you know, are, is dispersal really important? If dispersal was important, you'd like to think that ponds that are near each other would be similar because, you know, they're exchanging uh, dispersing organisms. Is that true? What do you think? Uh, yes, so, uh, the, so the dispersal might be the reason that nearby ponds are similar to each other, but so could the geological underpinning of the soils, for example, that could be spatially structured. So that would be an important thing to do and one thing to think about. So it makes you think about the tension between environmental uh, filtering and sp spatial effects. Uh, you can also look at this and see some exceptions. So take a look at this pond over here. It's blue and there's this little pond right next to it, which is clear. Those are separated by about uh, 20 meters. So, you know, despite being right next to each other, they seem to have completely different um, uh, biotas. Uh, it's also interesting to see that some of these ponds are really big and probably have a big influence on the landscape distributions. Other ones, seem like they're really small and you can imagine that they would have trivial effects on the larger scale patterns. Maybe. Uh, so, uh, so one of the things about meta community is to ecology that uh, allowed us to think about is understanding these kinds of patterns and being able to try to distinguish them by measuring, for example, local environmental conditions and spatial distribution. Uh, also, uh, it's interesting to think about the kinds of theories that would help us have better expectations about what this would look like and maybe conducting some experiments to really nail down the causal elements. <clears throat> so in the, our synthesis in 2004, which we did in 2001, uh, we identified four dominant ways in which people thought about meta-communities. So at the time, the main way that most people, if I had said the word meta-community, it would have evoked in most people this one model, set of models that had already been published by Levins and Culver and other people like that, called the competition colonization trade-off, which said that in a landscape that had disturbances, you could get coexistence of a good colonizer with a good competitor because the colonizer would always be colonizing new patches before the good competitor got there, and it could exist as a fugitive species in the landscape. So that would have been, you know, the main way in which people thought about meta-communities at that time. When I came into it, I wasn't thinking about competition colonization at all. I was thinking about how species that have different environmental affinities can coexist in a landscape and reestablish themselves or or uh, develop uh, communities if there were novel patches. And I call this the species sorting approach. So this corresponds, if you're a, a microbial ecologist, reasonably well to um, the idea that every species can be anywhere, or every species is everywhere, and local conditions select which ones actually thrive. Uh, the third, uh, so uh, when, when I put the proposal into NCs, to study this, these were the two uh, hypotheses, and we were going to have this working group to synthesize them and try to identify the ways in which we, you know, might study their differences. And in the first morning of our first meeting, uh, somebody showed up and uh, pulled out this book and said, well, what about this book that had just come out between the time we did the proposal and our first meeting, which was Hubble's Neutral Theory of uh, community ecology, and which 
How many of you are not familiar with that? Okay, so the idea there is that uh, many patterns in uh, communities could be explained without having to invoke any differences among species in how they interacted with each other. That it could be a totally stochastic process due to uh, dem demography, so life and birth and death of individuals, and dispersal across patches. So kind of unpalatable to me, but uh, I was like, yeah, hey, this book just came out. Sure, toss that in. We've got three things we're going to synthesize. And then during our first meeting, some of the folks in the, in the working group uh, started to disagree about whether coexistence of the competition colonization trade-off should involve the better competitor being the worst colonist or the better competitor being the best colonist. And the reason for that is that if you have very high dispersal, uh, uh, an organism that has very high dispersal will be tossing out lots of its propagules into an inhospitable environment where they could colonize other patches, but uh, where they would not be sustaining populations. So kind of like Calanus finmarchicus, you know, imagine if all the Calanus finmarchicus were good at staying in the hotspot, they'd be much, they'd have higher fitness instead of drifting out into space where their birth rate is less than their de uh, death rate. So by noon, we had four uh, different perspectives. And so that was pretty exciting. It was really great because it meant that we couldn't dichotomize our debates anymore. You know, nobody, you know, like if anybody started arguing that their point of view was really the one and everybody else was wrong, they'd be outnumbered three to one. And so uh, this helped us synthesize because, you know, like the only option anymore was to get along. And uh, so uh, one lesson is multiple hypotheses is better than two uh, <clears throat> in general. Okay, so, uh, so that paper was really influential and since then, so that was 2004, and since then it's been exciting to see how many different additional elements. People have conducted experiments including transplant experiments, migration experiments, tests for equivalence, uh, experiments on metacommunities per se where they create metacommunities and subject them to various treatments. And that's been pretty cool. There's also been, the, it also stimulated the way to analyze patterns in a bunch of different ways. I'm gonna focus on one of them, um, which is called variation partitioning, because I think it's probably the dominant thing that has been used to analyze patterns since then. <clears throat> and the idea behind variation partitioning is a statistical one, which is that um, <clears throat> If we have a site by species matrix, so like imagine that we go to all these ponds in Siberia and we go to each one, uh, we can measure, uh, we can look at the species that are there and we make a matrix. Pond A has species A, B, C, D. Pond B has some other species, including some shared ones with pond A, et cetera. <clears throat> we can try to explain that variation in different ways. So up until, uh, thinking about meta-communities, the main way people explained that, that kind of variation was by linking it to an purely environmental variables. So this is the idea that you know, some species like high pH, some species like low pH, et cetera, and they will distribute themselves across these sites according to those uh, proclivities. So that's got an old tradition to it, and that tradition corresponds quite well to the species sorting view, but would be pretty useless with either any of the other um, perspectives. So, uh, you know, and, and uh, so what's interesting about that is that we can think about how these patterns relate to community assembly by thinking about dispersal. So we have uh, a regional species pool, we have some dispersal constraints, so that would include you know, lags between environmental change and the arrival of species. And then we have the sort of environmental template that determines which species are present. So the spatial part comes in here, uh, which um, goes a little bit beyond what the RDA sort of uh, approach was until then. And the way uh, Carl Cotigny uh, approached this was by using this previously existing variation partitioning method that was developed by uh, Bocard and other authors. And the idea here is that now we have 
the same um, species of uh, same matrix of species distributions, we have the same environment matrix, but we're also going to try to study how um, spatial effects uh, affect uh, can help us explain or predict this matrix. And when you do that, you end up with three variation components look like this. So you have um, some variables that are uh, not environmental variables that explain species distributions but are not spatially structured, some spatial variables, predictors, that explain species distributions but are not associated with the environmental variables. And then you have the ones that you, you can't tell them apart because they involve environmental variables that are spatially structured. And what Carl did was to um, claim that we could distinguish these four different um, meta-community paradigms by looking at uh, this, uh, which ones of these variation components is important. If the species sorting is the only thing going on, then we should see only A being important. If mass effects are going on, then we should see both A and C being important. If the patch dynamics or the neutral theory is important, then we should only uh, being the important component. Uh, so there's been hundreds of papers that have done this, you know, and review, NASTA review, so many of them, they drive me crazy anymore. Uh, you know, and they usually go along the lines of tree hole mosquito communities are uh, uh, by species sorting and not the other stuff. Or, you know, uh, Parasites on some organism are driven by patch dynamics and not other stuff. So, you know, you get the idea. So, just. Quick question. Yeah. I'm having trouble distinguishing what spatial can be that doesn't include environmental. So, uh, so think of those, that big green lake and the little clear lake next to it. Imagine that you went in there and you found that there's no environmental difference. Bad example, sorry. Uh, two lakes that are the same uh, and, ha uh, and have uh, different environments in them. You would guess that they're the same because they're close to each other. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, you know, you might imagine that this would create patchiness. Certain parts of the landscape would be dominated by a species that had never been able to get to or been extirpated from another part of the landscape for some unknown reason that did not involve any of the environmental factors. Does that help? Yeah. So uh, I don't want to go in. <laughs> no, well, I'll, no, the, uh, the only thing I'm trying to convince you is that it could be that way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and the other thing that uh, I'm not going to try to convince you, but you'll have to take my word for it, is that there are like statistical methods that are insanely uh, refined, to be honest, that can identify these um, factors. <clears throat> so, if it were true, uh, we could find them using this method. So, um, just for fun, uh, I uh, did a little sort of meta-analysis of studies. There's, I uh, can't remember how many studies in this uh, plot, and what it plots is uh, the um, residual, so how much random variation there is, the environmental part, how much the composition of communities can be predicted by measuring things in the environment, and how much uh, can be predicted by spatial component, uh, so not related to the environment. And so using this method, we can take each meta community and make a dot here. And um, I tossed in, I focus on two different meta communities that are particularly interesting. One of them is the trees in Barrow, Colorado Island, which is where Hubble studied, and the ponds in Michigan that I studied. A couple things come out. One of them is that, by and large, there's a lot of residual variation, so there's a lot of unexplained variation in these analyses. Another one is that the environmental component, about 40%, is bigger than the average space component, about 20%. Another one is that there's a lot of spread in these uh, various analyses. So some meta communities seem to be, uh, you know, pretty uh, random. Uh, 
Others seem to do, you know, a uh, lot, be explained by other factors a lot more. And uh, I'm drawing your attention to these two. So they're interesting because in Barrow, Colorado Island, there's 60% um, stochastic variation and 40% uh, uh, spatial variation and no uh, environmental variation. So for that meta community, it looks like there's spatial stuff and uh, a lot of stochastic stuff, but not much environmental determinism in these, uh, the distribution of these trees at BCI. On contrast, uh, when I study freshwater ponds, I find no spatial variation and a substantial environmental variation and then also some stochastic variation. So basically, you can see how Hubble and I might come to very different uh, conclusions about this. The other thing is that basically everything else is in the middle. So uh, the world lies some, most often lies somewhere between Hubble and Leibold. And, uh, you know, so it's kind of good to know. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, I recently published this book, which um, is cool. It's fat. It's got a lot of stuff about meta communities. It's kind of a summary of where we, I think we are today. And the message of the rest of my talk is don't buy this book. Uh, <laughs> And that's where the rethinking meta community ecology goes. This book is pretty focused. It has a lot in it, but it still kind of plays around with these uh, four paradigms and this variation partitioning approach. And so uh, in this book, we talk about novel theories. So in addition to the four um, that I already talked about, we can think about evolution in meta communities, uh, altering things, uh, historical effects due to biogeography and phylogeny and uh, also how these patterns link to ecosystem level processes, which is cool and you should, especially since I get a little bit of money and I get citations if you cite it, uh, which, you know, I'm getting old, it doesn't matter, citations don't matter anymore. To me, I will be retiring soon and my merit pay is not dependent, as I'm sure yours isn't either, on kinds of things. Anyway, uh, the key ideas on a more process-oriented basis is that sometimes there's dispersal limitation. It takes a while for a species to discover the, all the patches in their environment where they will be winners. Sometimes there's dispersal excess where there, we have source-sync relations that maintain populations where they otherwise would not be. And sometimes it's kind of in between. Uh, species could have narrow habitat niches which would make habitat, uh, environmental variation unimportant or they might have, uh, make them important, sorry, or they might have broad habitat niches where it would reduce that idea. And then the other thing that uh, we realized is that um, the particular role of species interactions is not particularly well captured by these things. So even though we're thinking these species interact, we don't really, the variation partitioning doesn't really help us see how they interact. Um, so, uh, separate meta-communities that have interacting species from just having independent meta-populations. And uh, so that's all cool. Uh, there's other possibilities that we hadn't considered in 2004, uh, in 2001 when we actually thought about these things, including e ecological priority effects, uh, rock scissor paper kind of assembly rules, and then evolution of, a, of um, species within meta-communities. I'm not going to talk about. But basically, what I'm trying to convince you of right now is that um, these four ideas are like selling us short. Uh, they're not capturing the full range of possible things that can happen. And that the variation partitioning is a very crude tool that isn't uh, going to help us a lot more. Uh, we're just going to put more dots on that uh, triplot and find out that, yeah, Everything lies somewhere between Hubble and Leibold, and we'll just be filling it in. So uh, what's important to realize is that uh, these were cartoons of how species interact. And uh, in fact, probably in any given meta community, we have a combination of those ideas. So see, some, even though there might be environmental differences, there probably is variation in dispersal as well. Uh, and even though species might some species might show narrow uh, 
uh, environmental uh, affinities, other species may be habitat generalists. So how do we, <clears throat> and then these species might interact with each other in complicated ways. So how can we try to get away from these idealized situation cartoons into a more realistic kind of comprehensive framework? And so uh, what we've, what, and I'll tell you who we is in a minute, uh, have argued is that we need to shift the way we study these from an overall picture, like this meta community is species sorting, or this you know, picture, uh, uh, mosquitoes in tree holes or what have you, to kind of being able to pull out the roles of individual species uh, and yet still look at the overall pattern. Uh, We've um, argued that uh, there are new statistical methods that are much better than the variation partitioning, and that the other part of this puzzle would be to start teasing out the role of individual patches. So some patches would contribute to a species sorting. So for example, if they're inhabited by competitive dominance, another patch that might be abiotically the same patch could um, lead to spatial effects because let's say it's isolated or something like that. And so uh, the idea would be to try to figure out if we can tease apart the interaction between particular species and particular patches in this framework. So um, the work I'm going to talk about is with this group of characters over here. And it's a working group that's sponsored by IDIV, which is kind of the NC's equivalent in Germany. So it's very German. You have to pay your, you know, put in reports more regularly, and uh, the money is more carefully allotted, et cetera. But uh, it's still a very cool place. So what we did was we developed a toy model that looks like this. It tells you for each species in each patch what's the probability that it got colonized uh, when it was previously empty, and for each species in each patch that was previously occupied, what's the probability that it goes extinct. And I'm going to skip over this, uh, all these details, uh, but this is a general model. And what's cool about this is we can look at the probability, the log uh, likelihood ratio of occupancy by a species in a patch, and identify that it's a sum of the effects of uh, uh, immigration dis as it's determined by uh, dispersal. The, uh, in, let's see. Uh, interactions, uh, I'm sorry, environmental filters as they're determined by the uh, ability to successfully colonize a patch when uh, they arrive and as it's affected by the uh, consequences of competitors on that colonization ability and the uh, same thing for the extinction. So the probability that a species goes extinct in a patch due to the local environments as it's modified by the competition that it experiences in that patch. And that means that uh, we can try to identify variation components that correspond to each of these three terms and see if we can understand the patterns that result. So uh, in what I'm going to talk about, we did this in uh, this model and then we analyzed it using um, these statistical methods that I'm going to talk about. So uh, in order to do that, we uh, simulated the model multiple times under different scenarios. And then we analyze the results using this method, method in cult, that involves latent variables that are um, co cross correlations among the densities of um, species across the meta community. And we parse them into environmental, space, and interaction components for each species. The idea that uh, for the total meta community, it would be the sum across all species that uh, determines the overall pattern. Uh, there's a bunch of possible uh, alternatives to this. We decided to focus on these joint species distribution models, which are emerging, and in particular in one implementation by Oweiskanen et al. using this thing called HMSC, which right now is eluding me what it stands for, hierarchical something of species communities. I can't remember. Uh, anyway. Sorry, senior moment. Uh, <clears throat> and the idea is that we focus on the on basic processes that affect uh, community assembly, including drift, selection by environment, dispersal, uh, 
And in theory, there's also a speciation component that we're not including. Uh, the old version would be to convert these processes into these really highly idealized uh, models. Here I just put the four, and then we analyze them, the uh, species distribution using variation partitioning. What we're suggesting is, let's skip this step, let's uh, directly analyze this uh, matrix using and relate it to these basic principles here, and we can tie um, those um, basic ideas to different types of um, variation in the species distribution. What's important is we ignore these four uh, archetypes and we uh, do this on a species by species matrix on a species-by-species uh, species basis. So to kind of summarize uh, the, the um, <coughs> variation partitioning approach had this way of looking at community variation, relating it to environment and space. The uh, HMSC in its crudest form had these three where uh, it allowed us to separate a further uh, component, which is the cross correlations among the species which is uh, pretty cool. What we're arguing is that we can uh, study uh, this more carefully by plotting each species in the same kind of triplot. Uh, here I've plotted the four variation components because um, I'm also putting the total of variation explained, so the inverse of the residuals as the size of the symbol. So the way you would interpret a triplot like this is this species is strongly uh, related to uh, the environment. Uh, this species is only related to the space, but it's weak. Uh, and this species is strongly related by interactions with other species. Does that make sort of sense? There's a lot of complicated math and an analysis, and it's done in a hierarchical Bayesian approach. And yuck. Uh, but uh, that's the idea. And then uh, the idea is that for we can try to look at how this works something happened there, uh, by uh, plotting the, these uh, effects as a function of the uh, uh, features of the species or of the features of the site. So for example, we might expect that um, <coughs> the environmental component would be enhanced by high dispersal because it means species can find the good patches that they're in, uh, and it might be reduced in highly isolated sites. Um, so that's what we're working on. Here's um, <coughs> some results from these simulations where we subjected this, uh, the data from different simulations to this analysis. And uh, so we're kind of trying to validate this approach. So we did some simulations where there was no competition. So these are independent metapopulations. Uh, and we can contrast what happens when they have narrow niches versus broad niches. When they have narrow niches, uh, they're a big environment, they tend to cluster over here. When they have broad niches, this corresponds to, you know, just m independent metapopulations that have no relation to the environment. And they, um, uh, generally speaking, have very high, very low uh, r squares, so, and they're not environmentally structured. We can say what ha ask what happens when we impose competition on them, and we get, so if we compare this with that, this is what competition does. It moves a lot of these species away from this corner where they were following environmental gradients. And instead, they don't show as much of that, but they show a lot of uh, strong intercorrelations among each other. Uh, if they have broad niches, uh, they go from being very weak to a lot more um, uh, substantial, especially interaction components. set of scenarios. Uh, half of the species don't compete, but half of them do. So orange versus blue kind of lines up, just says that when you combine these, you can tell which ones are competing and which ones aren't. Uh, the <coughs> uh, no competition, but different dispersal rates. We get a different pattern. Uh, all species compete, but they vary in their dispersal rate, and we can get some other patterns as well. So this is showing the species perspective on it. Uh, for a meta-community ecologist, this is pretty nice. We've got a new probe, and it hel helps us understand 
that some species might be playing one role, whereas other species are playing a different role. But the wet dream for a meta-community ecologist is to say which patches are also contributing to these patterns. So is a highly isolated patch likely to, you know, play a different role than a patch that's at the center of the meta-community, or is our crowded parts of the meta-community different than sparse parts of the meta-community. And in order to do that, it would be nice to be able to do the same thing from the spatial, uh, from the patch perspective. So this took a little trick, and uh, we think we've solved it. This is a graph that I got a week ago, and I'm trying desperately to get a cleaner, better looking graph than this. But um, this shows those same simulations uh, for one of those scenarios. Each point on here is a different patch. So in our simulations, we had 10 species in each meta community, and we had 100 patches. So now when I change over to the patch perspective, we've got 10,000 patches. And uh, so, you know, a lot more data points. But you can see that um, they tend to be clustering over here, uh, which is corresponds to the average effect that the species variation partitioning had, but that there's an enormous amount of scatter in uh, these, uh, the ways that individual patches are uh, contributing to this pattern. So some of them are way over here, some of them are way over here, some of them are way over here. And uh, I had hoped that sometime today I'd get an email with a figure that would correlate each of these two patterns to the dispersal and the isolation. But I haven't checked my email because I've been yapping too much. And I also don't think I got that email. Uh, but maybe next week I will. It's pretty, I'm really excited about this because this would completely transform the way we study meta community. Uh, so one additional thing to say about this uh, uh, enhanced uh, approach using uh, also the interaction component is that it does change the total amount of variation that we explain. So if you remember in the triplot, the initial triplot using the variation partitioning, on average about 80% of the variation seemed to be random, uh, stochastic. The question is if we also take into account the interactions among species, how much more of the variation do we explain? So here's a uh, st uh, analysis that I did with Pedro Perez Neto with a little bit of a different approach. We used uh, GLM, stack GLMs to do this, but uh, I think we'll find the same thing. We used it on this uh, fish community from 3,000 Canadian lakes, and we did the variation, component, variation partitioning, so in pure environment, pure space, confounded environment by space, and our residuals for using the variation partitioning is 75% of the variation. So looks like the average study that we did in that um, meta-analysis. What we then did was take the residual variation after accounting for both space and environment and ask what kind of cross-relations are there among the species in the community that cannot be random. And we found that a total of 50% um, could be uh, related to this kind of variation that in what I just talked about, we associate with species interactions, leaving only 25% of the truly residual variation uh, in the system. So if this is at all typical of what we'll find, it will convert uh, meta-community ecology from a science that is satisfied with explaining, you know, 30, percent of the variation into one that will start to be a little bit more ambitious. And I don't know that we'll always get to 80, but like it will be a bigger number no matter what. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Uh, so one of the important things to, to point out, and it's a really big caveat, I think I have it on this next slide. Uh, yeah, over here is that uh, this residual variation that we I, I associate with species interactions is n we not necessarily due to species interactions. It could be due to unmeasured variables, including other environmental variables that we didn't measure, or to poorly, to, uh, poorly specified spatial 
uh, relations. So, uh, you know, ways in which, for example, the movement of organisms in the Gulf of Mexico could be misidentified by our hydrological models or what have you. Uh, <clears throat> so in our model, we don't have any of those. We know what the spatial model is and what you know that there are no unmeasured environmental variables. But in nature, these are important things to think about. Um, so highlight that, uh, you know, it's not a silver bullet or anything. So um, <clears throat> it be nice to see if we can identify why spe individual species differ from each other and see how far we can get it on that course. Same thing with the patches. And the one thing we haven't yet done is analyze any real data. Um, <clears throat> the implications are pretty cool because we get us to thinking about uh, more applied questions that, you know, like how, how would future habitat fragmentation or patch alterations change things. Uh, we might be able to do that. We might be able to incorporate invasive species into these types of distributions by understanding how they uh, play out in this uh, in the spatial component and environmental component. And it might uh, help us understand uh, which species of, uh, of extinction or which species are playing keystone roles by being important in the interaction component here. And might help us on prioritize conservation areas and corridors, for example. <clears throat> so mostly, I've tried to convince you that uh, meta-community ecologies come a long way. Those four paradigms that form the structure of this book that I just spent, spent five years writing uh, are kind of a waste of time. And uh, the thing to look forward to is where we can go with meta-community ecology version 2.0. And uh, thanks a lot. <laughs>